Good evening, everybody. If everybody could take a seat, I think we're about to get started. We want to welcome everybody to our downtown 2030 community meeting and say a big thank you to you for coming out in this freezing cold weather. So we really appreciate that you made the effort to join us tonight. Plenty of seats down front. And you might make it on BevCam if you're sitting down front. <coughs> so we are here tonight to, to get your thoughts and your opinions about the current state of downtown Beverly as well as what you want to see within the next five to ten years. So just to put things in context, how many of you were here for our last community meeting with our downtown expert consultant, Kennedy Smith? Were any of you in that room? Wow, good showing. So when we decided that Actually, what, was, what our impetus for doing this now, because people are like, but wait a minute, it's only 2018, why are you thinking about 2030? The main reason is because we were informed by the mayor that the city is gonna undertake the master planning process starting next year. And the city has um, commissioned a number of studies over the last several years the housing study, the hotel feasibility study, um, a transportation study, and we wanted to be able to hand the city a, an updated downtown study. So that's really what kind of drove us. The master plan actually will result with much higher level goals, whereas our downtown 2030 plan, much like our 2020 plan, will result in very actionable goals and outcomes. So we immediately thought what Kennedy brought us last time has worked. And the team that has worked to implement her recommendations has pretty much stuck together. And many of the board members are in the room today. So we thought, why mess with success? And so we reached out to Kennedy, and she was available. So we're thrilled to be able to have her back helping us through this effort. Um, just two of the things that have changed as a result of that 2020 plan, um, we've had over $140 million in private and public investment in the last eight years. That is amazing. Between the, the new investment in Rantoul Street, Broadway, Ellis Square from the public side, and then all the new housing development, facade improvements by property owners, all that adds up to a lot of money that's been invested in downtown Beverly in the last couple of years. And when we first started our 2020 effort, I don't know if any of you took the survey, but we did a community survey at that time. And we created one of those word clouds to kind of show what's, we asked people, what's one word you would use to describe downtown Beverly? And the most popular answer was quaint, followed soon by dirty, brown, unsafe. And that really spurred Beverly Main Streets to kind of totally shift how we operated. The other thing that spurred us was Kennedy called us out in the report saying, you guys are spending all your energy on events, but you're not doing the harder work of economic development. And so we shifted our focus and we have really remained, kept a laser focus on the goals that we set out that included economic development, design, and events. So I think what you see in the downtown now is a result of a lot of that work. And we have a lot of people in this room to thank. Um, so now here we are trying to think about 2030. Um, back when we were starting 2020, we almost felt like almost anything we did would make an improvement because we had a lot of empty stores. We had a lot of shopping carts in people's doorways. It was dark. Um, but now it's going to be tougher. Because we've done so much and you see the benefits of, of having a, a vision that everybody is part of, this time is going to be harder. Like, what is the next big thing? Last time it was easier. So we're really lucky to have Kennedy on board this year. Um, 
I want to stop and say a couple of thank yous. The first is to the folks here at First Baptist Church for hosting us tonight. We've got the BevCam folks. Um, we have Heather Wolsey, who's our marketing director and also our logistics queen slash master who made all of this kind of come together. And we have an intern from Endicott College named Colin Brewer, who you may have met. And all of those folks have worked together to make this a success tonight. Um, so our agenda is, in the month of November, we're doing three things to try and get people's input. Last time, between focus groups, the survey, the community meeting, we heard from about 1,000 residents to form the Downtown 2020 plan. So this, this time around, we're spending the whole month of November listening. We've scheduled 15 different locations all around the downtown. Um, we've done five or six of them already, like at Gentilly Brewing and Super Sub and Atomic and Henry's and I think tomorrow, we're somewhere tomorrow, I think at the Senior Center. And all we're doing is listening to people where they are um, then we're doing this meeting, and then we also have an online survey, which almost 400 people have already taken, so we encourage you to do that. Um, so that's what we're doing in November. And then Kennedy will issue kind of like a draft report after the holidays. The Main Streets Board and the Downtown 2030 Committee will then kind of review that report and figure out what we as an organization can take on. Um, and I just remind everybody, the organization is from a paid staff, it's me and Heather. And then we have over 125 volunteers and partners who help us do the work. So it really does take a village to make this happen. Um, so then we expect by maybe May or June to issue a final report with some um, priorities of what we're gonna focus on and how and what our expected outcomes are. So that's kind of our schedule for the project. Our agenda for tonight is Kennedy is gonna come up and she's gonna share with us, much like she did last time, some downtown trends that she's seeing across the world that she thinks might work here in Beverly. She's, it's great that she has the hindsight of what we were eight years ago um, and can kind of talk to how things have changed. And then we'll, we were kind of debating based on the number of people who actually um, attended tonight, whether we would do breakout groups or not. If we stay at this number, I think we'll just do general group Q&A so that everybody, I think there's enough people that we can kind of do that, that Kennedy will um, facilitate. And then if we do get an influx of people, we've, we will probably break out. Um, I do encourage you to look at the comment card, the yellow comment card in the pews. The question that we're asking people to answer and leave in the table on the, in, there's a black um, basket at the table at the end. If you don't have comment cards in your pew, please raise your hand and we'll get you some. But the question is, um, which of Kennedy's slides or which of Kennedy's ideas that you hear tonight do you think would work in Beverly? So just kind of keep that in mind. If you need a pen, we've got some in the back and we can deliver those to you. Um, but that's what we're asking people to kind of, again, it's another way to kind of get people's thoughts about what resonates with you. So with that, I want to introduce Kennedy Smith. Um, she is a partner and co-founder of the CLUE Group, which stands for Community Land Use and Economics. Um, but for 13 years, she was the executive director of the National Main Streets Program, which we are a member of. And um, she has won all kinds of accolades for her thinking about downtown and urbanism. Um, and I think her biggest, the biggest testimonial I can say to her is just look at our downtown, because she really spurred us on and gave us the ideas and helped us set priorities. and. So I think that's probably the best thing we can say. The other thing we did that I hope we're able to do this time, you know, I used to be a management consultant and consultants sometimes kind of come in, give you a report and then walk away and don't really ever care whether what they gave you was worth it. Well, what we did last time was we, we kept Kennedy on retainer for the first year.
so that we weren't left with just this paper report saying, go do it, and just kind of walk away. So that was really helpful, that, and that's something that I hope we're able to do again. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Kennedy Smith. Kennedy, these are the passionate people of Beverly who want to make downtown better. Thank you. Okay. So I think you're on. Well, a lot, a lot has changed in uh, those eight years besides those things. Like, we're all eight years older. Um, and the downtown has changed a lot. I, have, I was hoping I could superimpose this with a video of, uh, that I shot today of Cabot Street. But it is a different place than it was eight years ago. A lot of things have changed, uh, a lot of things for the good. Um, so as Jin said, I'm going to talk about some trends that, are, that seem to be affecting downtown. Another of the ma those major changes over the past eight years is that the retail industry has gone through seismic changes um, since 2010. And although retail is not necessarily the biggest component of any downtown, it's an important component. And so I'm going to talk about that a fair amount. Um, and I want to start by talking about the past a little bit because, um, you know, historically downtowns were really the only shopping and working option for communities of this size. Everybody, everybody shopped downtown. Everybody worked downtown. Many people lived downtown. Everything was there. Um, and that was a sort of a, a cycle beginning after World War II of gradually uh, changing, of that sort of uh, diminishing. We built all this new housing for returning uh, GIs uh, out in the suburbs, and people started moving out there in droves. Um, and retail, which had always been downtown, began to follow them out. Um, the first retail that moved out to the burbs was uh, sort of convenience-oriented, groceries, gasoline, uh, fast food, which was a whole new thing then, uh, designed around the car industry, started moving out to the burbs um, where people were. And before too long, we had, we had major regional enclosed shopping malls, which were designed primarily to sell apparel, to sell clothing, shoes, jewelry. Uh, that historically was about 90% of what shopping malls sold and they sort of saturated a 20, 30 mile radius. And you've got North Shore here, and that's kind of a great example um, of how that happened. Um, shopping malls took this piece out of the downtown retail market. If you have an, on the vertical axis just stuff you can buy in a downtown or buy in the world, um, and then on the uh, horizontal axis, the price points at which you can buy it, shopping malls were going after mostly clothing, mostly for middle income, middle America. That's what they, that's what they went after. And so that piece kind of disappeared from downtowns. And because shopping malls even now are so strong in the apparel category, that's why it's so hard to get apparel stores to work downtown. They have to be sort of destinations in and of themselves, or there has to be enough critical mass to support a cluster of them to make them collectively um, enough of an attraction to make that work. So a lot of downtown businesses closed, department stores, clothing stores um, closed or moved out to the new malls. Then these guys came along. Um, I remind people that Walmart actually started out as a locally owned uh, business in a downtown, um, took the wrong drugs, apparently something went hor horrifically wrong and it turned into the Incredible Hulk, um, and it now is this. And what, what the big box stores did was sort of took this piece out of the market. Um, and if you overlay that with the piece that shopping malls had, you can see why so many shopping malls are in trouble. We have uh, an enormous number of dead and dying shopping malls, and shopping malls that are being repurposed, and shopping malls that are being demolished across the country now. Since I was here in 2010, the shopping mall that killed my hometown downtown on the eastern shore of Maryland has now been demolished and is uh, a vacant field. So um, it's just been, a, it's been brutal out there. Um, that triggered a whole new wave of closings, not only downtown, but also of a sort of earlier big box stores um, and strip shopping centers uh, out on the mall. Now we have these guys and a whole new uh, thing happening in retail. So a lot has changed in, uh, in the past few years. Um, Amazon recently opened this bookstore not far from where I live, which just, you know, my gosh, there is a sense of humor in the universe, huh? Um, that these things should happen. And like I say, we have just hundreds and hundreds of uh, dead and dying shopping malls. Um, and in the past couple of years, a pretty rapidly accelerating uh, round of national retail chains closing. Uh, in large part, this is because uh, they expanded too quickly and were, and were overextended. In part, it's because of uh, earnings pressure from uh, shareholders and the companies. But lots and lots of brands that we've known for a long time um, have closed or are in danger. Uh, so far, as of the end of last week, 
2018, we've had 5,468 national retail chains close in the US, um, and only 3,060 new ones have opened. So it's, um, you know, not good. Uh, even the big box stores are closing, leapfrogging into um, bigger stores and markets where they can. Some are being turned into new facilities. This is a library in Colorado made from an old Walmart. Um, some are being torn down to build bigger Walmarts. Um, the, the, whole, the whole problem basically is that we have, we have built too much retail space over the years. In 1960, we had four square feet of retail space per person. Um, in the US, we now have 41.6, um, so a 10 tenfold increase uh, over the course of a few decades. Um, the worldwide average is four square feet. Um, we only have enough market demand to support about 17, and that's actually shrinking. Um, we've, we've taken a dip in supportable retail sales since the economic downturn, and for reasons I'm gonna talk about in a second, it's probably gonna stay, stay that way for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and what we've replaced you know, downtown businesses with is stuff like this, um, places that are completely unrecognizable. These are in all different parts of the country. This one was in, this is in uh, Missouri. This is in Michigan. This is in Virginia. They all look exactly the same. Um, I photoshopped out the name of the business and its logo. Do you know what it is? How about that one? How about that one? Isn't that scary? It's like, it's like the corporations are scattering their logos uh, on the roads leading into our towns and making them look like every other place, completely losing a sense of uh, unique identity. Um, so here's some, uh, here's some fun facts to dream about tonight. 82% of the US population now lives within a 15 minute drive of a CVS. Worldwide, more than one billion people live within 10 minutes of a McDonald's. Mall visits in the US dropped by 50% between 2010 and 2013 and have fallen every year since then. 2017 was the worst year on record for store closures in the US are good, depending on how you look at it, I guess. The average US household owns 300,000 things. The average American will spend 3,680 hours looking for misplaced phones, <laughs> keys, sunglasses, and other items over the course of her or his lifetime. That equals 153 days. Only 3% of all the children in the world live in the US, but they own 40% of all the world's toys and children's books. There are more televisions than people in the US. We have more shopping centers than high schools. We spend more on jewelry and shoes than on higher education. We, are, we have too much stuff. We are too over retail. And 47% of American households have no savings. So uh, it's a big problem. And we've seen that reflected in our downtowns over the past few decades. Uh, and coming out of that tailspin is, uh, is a challenge. Um, there is some, there's some good news on the horizon, though. Uh, one thing in particular is, is, that, is that millennials uh, prefer shopping in locally owned businesses and in downtowns. They like real places um, more than their parents and, and a generation before that. They dine and shop more than those than other uh, age cohorts, but they spend 27% less than Gen X. So they like going out, they like the experience of being in a lively district, um, but they're not buying as much stuff. 70% of millennial shopping takes place in brick and mortar stores. Um, their, their shopping preferences, their buying preferences are definitely reshaping retail. They're much more inclined to repair things that break rather than throw them away. Um, they're more inclined to repurpose things and make them into new things. Um, they like shopping for used merchandise. Um, it feels environmentally responsible to them. Um, there are even uh, labels that are now catering to this. This is a men's clothing uh, uh, manufacturer in the UK and they make things that are meant to last for several generations. So everything that they sell has a label in it where the first owner puts his name in and the date he acquired it, then the second owner, then the third owner, really completely reshaping our thinking about uh, the products and services that we buy. Um, they are very much into the sharing economy um, where instead of you know, owning your own car, you share a car, uh, you do Airbnb. Um, and they love locally owned businesses. They like the uniqueness um, of them and the unexpected things that you can find in uh, locally owned businesses, independently owned businesses. Um, um, of all retail sales out there, only 9% um, are currently made online, and 52% of the purchases go to brick and mortar stores. So people are buying things from independent businesses online, even through venues like Amazon. Um, almost 80% of all apparel purchases in the US are still made in traditional stores. So there are some bright spots in all of this, but clearly the retail industry 
just as it was when I was here eight years ago, is now going through a whole new fundamental set of shifts uh, that's reshaping retail. There are seven kind of trends or things, I would say these are things that I see that are characteristic of successful downtowns in recent years that I wanted to talk about tonight. The first is the importance of building a complete economic ecosystem, which is what downtowns were originally, so that it's not just shopping, but it's also housing and um, entertainment and offices, uh, government, worship, all of those things are part of a healthy, vibrant downtown. So in essence, uh, by catering to the, to the people who live in the district, you're eliminating the need for uh, cars um, over time. It kind of makes it a more self-supporting economic uh, community. Second is the importance of cultivating small industry, which has always been a big part of downtowns. Um, my, my partner and I have been for, I don't know, the past five years or so, looking at old Sanborn fire insurance maps for downtowns across the country. These fire insurance maps, if you haven't seen them before, they're really, they're fabulous. Um, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company did these maps every, sometimes for, for some communities, every year, but certainly every five or ten years, um, where they, they did precise drawings of every building and color-coded it so that you could see what the building materials were. That was for fire insurance purposes. But in the process of doing this, they also labeled every single business and every single use on the map. So we've been going through and tallying up how many of X kind of business or Y kind of business or use were in downtowns at the peak of their economic power and um, success. What would you guess at their peak um, of economic performance, what percentage of all downtown uses spaces were retail businesses? 60, 45, 90, 24, 17, 17, 17 percent. We think that retail is a major component and um, it's a visible component, it's the most visible piece because you see it on the, on, the, on the storefront level. But even historically, the ground floors were active but they weren't necessarily retail. They had stuff, you, you could see what was going on in the building, um, but they, and so it felt like it was sort of that blur between the, the public space of the street and the private space of the business, but it was really just sort of the porous uh, illusion that kept people moving, moving along. I think we have a couple generations that have grown up now with the reality of shopping malls, and so we think that everything is retail, but in reality, uh, downtowns never were um, uh, a majority of, of retail uses. Lots of small manufacturers, and you still see many of these that have been around in downtowns for for decades uh, that are still in place. Um, and lots of new ones coming in. I just saw this in Cuero, Texas, um, about maybe six or eight months ago, a guy who makes uh, custom furniture as part of a cluster of uh, businesses on a side street that all do sort of custom manufacturing for homes, like custom-made tile and uh, things like that. This is a guy who has a, uh, has a, has a, a new computer modeled uh, a tailoring business where he, you, 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 you go in and he scans your body um, and then can design like exactly, exactly tailored suits for you, which are all hand sewn, I, you know, kind of love the um, distilleries. Um, all of these new, these, these new industries are going to be an important part of downtown's economic future. A third thing is to develop new businesses rather than recruit them. Here's the thing about downtowns is um, when you ask people what they want to see in their downtown, they'll tell you, I want a Starbucks, I want a Gap, I want a blah, blah, blah. Um, and the national retail chains are not risk takers. They, they want to go where it's a safe market. They, they follow the market, they don't lead the market. And so um, they have very precise criteria. Um, William Sonona won't go into a community that has under 100,000 people within a five mile radius of the store. They have income criteria, they have education level criteria. And they have the, um, 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 requirements about who their co-tenants are, who goes on each side of them. So the thing is, they're not going to come into downtowns where the market isn't already you know, vibrant and booming. And by that point, who wants them anyway? You know, you've already done the hard work of developing the businesses that you want. You can't really recruit independently owned businesses. You know, I mean, you can get somebody to open a second business or potentially to relocate a business. But it's not so much recruiting as developing. And that's going to be, um, I think, an important part of downtown Beverly's next, uh, next 10 years. I just put this one in because I love it, because it shows how cantankerous independently owned businesses can be. This is in Cooperstown, New York, and uh, the, the town council uh, passed an ordinance uh, outlawing food trucks. So this guy opens a restaurant that he calls food truck, right in the downtown. And it looks just like a food truck when you go and it's like, you know, tiny little thing and they sell food truck food. I just lo I love that. Um, 
And it, this also gives you some control over things like business placement. If you're developing businesses for specific locations, you can create the kind of you know, synergy on the street that you actually need instead of uh, letting the randomness happen of uh, weird leasing things. There are lots of ways that communities are um, cultivating locally owned businesses. Um, co-working spaces are, are a, 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 a piece of that puzzle. And there are specialized co-working spaces now that focus on woodworking, where you share the equipment or machining or sewing. Um, there's the inside of this place where they have a woodworking set. Um, and even business accelerators are beginning to focus on the kinds of businesses that come into downtown. An accelerator is sort of like a co-working space on steroids in that you, you um, give, you have a competition, people have to apply to go to the co to, to, to go to the um, 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 accelerator uh, and kind of hone their business skills. They put each person who's selected together with a team of mentors um, who can help them with marketing, with uh, finding capital, um, with uh, perfecting their product, whatever it might be. Um, and then they also give them uh, a capital investment, like a capital investment in the company, in exchange for which the business, once it is launched, um, will, um, it, you know, if it succeeds, that capital investment that the, um, the uh, accelerator has made, has, 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 um, um, made um, um, translates into like maybe 5% or 7% of the business's um, equity. So as the business su succeeds, the accelerator uh, continues to, uh, uh, to work. Um, businesses that were born in, in accelerators are things like um, uh, Dropbox, um, Reddit, um, all came from accelerator environments. Um, and, you know, where are they locating? They're locating in old buildings in downtowns. That's where they like to be. They like, again, the synergy of the people, the mix of businesses, the mix of activities, and the, and the creative energy that comes from those, from those casual uh, interactions. Um, you can also, you can help businesses reposition themselves and, and um, uh, sort of launch new businesses or, 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 or uh, um, buy new pieces of the market. Uh, here's my old graph again, but uh, usually what I like to do is I like to put a dot on this graph for every business in a downtown. Um, Sometimes they get multiple dots because they sell weird combinations of things. Um, I saw not too long ago a business in Oklahoma that's called Bucks Guns and Dolls. They sell guns and dolls. Um, my, my favorite of all time is Fluff 'em, Buff 'em, Stuff 'em from Canyon City, Colorado. It's a combination auto detailing, hair salon, taxidermy. Um, so they get, they get three dots because they're clearly doing three different kinds of things. Um, but you've got this sort of constellation, and you know you can see from this that there are some parts of the of the graph that are empty, and you can then think, okay, so why is that empty? Is there some other entity, a shopping mall, a shopping center, a nearby town, that's kind of captured that market? Um, where is there some market demand growing? If we look five or ten years down the road at how the population is changing, might there be some new market opportunities there? And so the first thing, so you can kind of um, um, identify here on the right, that's an un unmet part of the market that maybe has no competition. Over here, there's sort of a cluster of businesses uh, on the left that are performing pretty well together and have created some market prominence, some critical mass within the, the regional market. So you can help existing businesses move into that new space, perhaps by, in, in this case, um, um, upscaling their, their products a bit. Um, you can get existing businesses, encourage them to uh, create new ones uh, within the same cluster. And then finally, after helping existing businesses take advantage of the changed retail landscape, um, you can then look at developing some new businesses to uh, take advantage of these new opportunities and help, over time, reposition economically the downtown and its performance. Um, creating local development capital is an important piece of this, too. Um, what you need to launch a new business is creative ideas and money. Those are the two things. So often people who have creative ideas don't have money, and people who have money don't always have creative ideas. So it's the work of an organization like this to help put those things together um, and find people who have uh, a great idea for a business and some business acumen and find people who can invest in that business and help it get launched um, and be well capitalized so that its chances of success um, are better, um, helping those businesses find, uh, find the money. Um, crowdfunding is a great way to do this. It's a more mature market across the Atlantic uh, in the UK where you can look at sites like Crowdcube, which is a crowdfunding platform there in the UK, um, and see the kinds of businesses that have been active there, because they got going on this about three or four years before we did in the US, before we passed uh, the Jobs Act that created uh, crowdfunding mechanisms. Um, and so here's some examples. This is the Hebridean Food Company. It was a restaurant that makes 
apparently great soup, and so they um, launched a new business uh, that just focused on selling uh, prepackaged uh, soup that they could sell in grocery stores. Uh, haberdasher, and this is, I mean, these are truly downtown businesses. Here's the, uh, here's the haberdashery. It would blend in, it, it would fit on any, any main street in the US. Um, and these businesses were funded almost completely by people in the community uh, pooling their money and investing, uh, buying, buying shares of stock in these businesses to get them going. Um, this is a, another kind of example. This is um, in Clare, Michigan. This was a bakery that had been in, in business for 100 years. And the, owners, and the owner's kids and grandkids no longer wanted to run the business, so they were going to close it. And the local police department was like, wait, you can't do that. That's where we get our donuts. So the, the police department, all nine of them, uh, got together and bought the, uh, bought the bakery and renamed it Cops and Donuts. And it's a, uh, a great success. Um, a similar uh, a, a story, kind of variation on this, this is in Port Washington, Wisconsin. Um, there was a building, a historic building, that had a very beloved restaurant in it that was going to be torn down, and the restaurateur was, was just going to close if that happened. And this one guy in town was like, wait, this can't happen. So um, he put together a little LLC and invited people to buy shares of stock for $500 each. Um, he has a requirement that those shares of stock, 80% of them have to be owned locally. Um, and they together bought the building and kept the business going. Um, and it's been so successful that they're now taking on new projects, including uh, some infill housing uh, on their waterfront. There's the, the view from the, uh, the new housing over their harbor. And they've started a cafe also to go in the building with the, uh, with the restaurant. All, all local capital. This is a, an example that I really love, um, and there are some spin-off variations of this now. This was a, a candy company in the UK. It was a mom and pop owned uh, downtown candy store, and they wanted to expand and begin packaging their candy and selling it, uh, wholesaling it to um, grocery stores and other, other retailers. Um, and they went to financial institutions to get financing for the expansion. They couldn't get, they couldn't get the funding. So what they did was they issued chocolate buns and uh, sold these things for 100 pounds, 500 pounds, and 1,000 pound nominations. But instead of paying their dividends, their quarterly dividends in cash, they paid them in chocolate. So if you buy one of these, then every three months you get a box of chocolate. Uh, from them, which was, you know, had minimal cost to them to produce, less than paying an actual dividend. Um, and people got these kind of as a novelty. They got them as Christmas gifts and uh, birthday gifts for uh, friends and family. Um, I've been working with a group of artists in Austin who are, um, who are kind of squatters in these shotgun houses along Waller Creek, if you know Austin at all. Waller Creek is this creek that kind of runs along the edge of the downtown. And the, um, the, the creek, um, which used to flood every couple of years, they've kind of rerouted it so it's no longer flooding, and so they have developable land there in downtown Austin. So the city wants to redevelop this land, and the squatters were going to get kicked out of their houses, and they're like, wait, we love being here. So they are now looking at the possibility of selling art bonds, where um, people would invest in them, and they get paid in artwork that the artists produce. They had a really, a really nice brochure. I really love this. Um, another important thing is using multiple sales distribution channels, getting retailers to think of their market no longer as people who might physically walk in the front door, but as the entire world, because we have this internet thing, and it works. Um, so this is, a, this is a woman who owns a, 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 a floral shop not too far from where I live, who does uh, deliveries during lunchtime from a bike cart in the downtown. Uh, these women had a yarn store. They found that there wasn't quite enough market to support the yarn store in the downtown where they were. So they decided to go mobile in addition to having their physical store. So uh, one day a week they go to nearby communities and sell yarn there. This is a, uh, uh, a vending machine outside a butcher shop so that uh, when he closes every day at 4.59 p.m., um, he can load up the machine and people can come by later. It's, it's refrigerated. It's all safe. Um, and buy their, uh, buy their steaks for the evening. Um, this is a guy named William Reese on the left uh, who makes um, concert and Celtic harps. He's in downtown Rising Sun, Indiana. Um, pretty much everybody in Rising Sun who's needed a concert harp has bought one by now. Um, there isn't much of a local market for that. Um, his customers all find him online. That's where, they, that's where they find him, that's where they buy his harps. But it is such a great business to have in the downtown because you walk down the street and you hear harp music all of a sudden kind of wafting out the door. And he, he usually works right in the storefront so that you can see him like carving the headstock for these, for these uh, harps. And he's happy to have you come in and take a look at them and he shows you how he does it. 
And um, he sells these t-shirts in the front that say, love a harpist, there are only 82 strings attached or many strings there are that people buy. Um, no local market at all. It's all, it's all non-local, but a great addition to, to the downtown. Um, so new businesses might, who might have a hard time making things work with just local sales by augmenting that with 20% online sales and maybe 10% sales to other businesses can really turn things around and be successful. Um, sixth thing that's important is to animate the district. Remember I talked about how millennials like going to lively districts. They don't spend as much money, but they like being there. They are drawn to that. Um, they like the excitement, the uh, uh, unexpected surprises that you find in downtowns and in independent businesses. And it's important to animate the district to, to, keep, it, to keep it interesting. Um, what do I mean by that? It can be very low touch things. It can be kind of high tech things. This is a, this was actually graffiti. Somebody did this. Um, it's one of these things when you look at it from the front, you don't see what it is. When you look at it on the edge, something emerges. I mean, that's really good graffiti, you know, Just that pop up overnight. Um, this is a, a tree painted on a, a brick wall, exposed brick wall, with um, uh, liquid sensitive paint. So during the daytime when it's dry, you don't see it. But when it rains, it pops. You can see it. And then it kind of fades back into the, into the uh, brick. Um, this is in downtown Nashville. They, since their um, uh, traffic light switching boxes have power, they um, wrapped these with images of Nashville recording artists and installed these, these narrow focused directional speakers in the backs of them so that when you walk by, you suddenly hear this blast of music from this recording artist, really reinforcing Nashville's kind of brand. Uh, there's the speaker you can see at the top um, of being a music city. Uh, this is a, uh, a geotagging program that have, they've done in a few uh, cities in uh, Canada. There's a project similar to this in the US called the Yellow Arrow Project. And basically, people um, go online and they record a story about why a place in the downtown is important to them. When you see one of these signs, you can then go to the website or you can dial a phone number and punch in the code and you hear that person's story talking about what happened at that place that made it so special to them. And you can record your own story then on top of that so it develops this whole rich patina of the experiences people have collectively had with different places in their downtowns. Um, this is a, a building that was uh, rehabbed for um, apartments for musicians, um, and it has a recording studio in the, on the ground floor, of course, with a storefront so you can see what's happening. When anybody goes in there, they can flip the switch, um, and this light comes on that says recording now on the outside of the building, so if you're walking by or you see the light, you can then go online and you can hear what they're doing in the recording studio. There's the, there's the recording panel. This is, um, I love this. This is uh, actually, it was a, 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 a vacant storefront. And they, um, you know those, anybody play Xbox? No Xbox? Xbox has this sort of responsive thing where you can go like this and it knows that you want to toss a ball this way. It's called Kinetic. They stripped out the Kinetic device from an Xbox, put it on the outside of the storefront, and they have a scrim behind the storefront glass. Then they recorded this guy doing these acrobatic maneuvers um, against a green screen, and it's activated by the kinetic. So when somebody walks by, the, the video responds to what's happening on the street. Some people walk by, ignore it. Some people have heart attacks. I'm just joking, but they really get, they really get into it. Um, and it is really simple to do. Um, except for the kinetic, we could just use like a heat sensor or a motion sensor and make this happen with stuff we have in this room tonight. Um, I'll show you the setup. There's the guy getting uh, filmed against the green screen. Uh, and there's sort of the setup. So the sidewalk has the, the camera, the infrared camera, the scrib, the, the, the scrim behind the glass, and a computer and a backlight projector. And that's kind of it. It's a pretty, pretty simple thing to do. Um, I've seen this used also by a ballet company to promote their, their new season. They have an X on the sidewalk, and they say stand here, and it just uses a motion sensor. And if you go like this, um, a ballerina jumps that way. And if you go like that, she jumps that way. And if you go like this, a whole bunch of them come running in and jump up in the air. And there's like a line down the sidewalk, people waiting to play with this thing. And this is a vacant storefront, you know? Um, and there are so many, so many variations on this. But it's easy, easy technology available to us now to, uh, to use to help make a downtown sidewalk really be kind of like a street theater place where exciting things are happening. This is another one that I love. This was a neighborhood in uh, London. I hope the video works. It was called Make Rivington Street Snow. Everybody in London is always, you know, 
they like to make small talk in the UK. And so it's like, do you think it's going to snow on Christmas this year? So this neighborhood decided, we're going to make it snow on Christmas. So um, oh, there we go. So what they did was they put five snow cannons on top of buildings on this street. And they put that, 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 that poster up everywhere. Here you can see them wiring um, the snow cannons to an Arduino board that's triggered um, with an app so that when somebody dials the number, it's, it, 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 it shoots off one of the, uh, the snow cannons and makes the street snow. It'll come on in a second. There they are, plugging it all in. And turning it on, and oh, it's going to stop there. Well, take my word for it. When they call the number, all of a sudden, the street is filled with snow. Really a magic, magic thing. Um, this kind of animation can extend into the stores also. This is a business, if you guys have not seen it, you're within driving distance, go see it. It's called Bodega. It's in Jamaica Plain. Um, and it is, it looks like a bodega, you know, a Latino grocery store. You go inside and it looks like it's a bodega. And then in the corner of the store, there is a Snapple juice machine. And on the floor in front of it, there's a brass button. And when you stand on the brass button, um, 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 step on it, the door of the Snapple juice machine swings open, and behind it, there's a men's clothing store called Bodega. High-end stuff, they sell uh, casual clothes and high-end designer sneakers. Um, they're doing $1,800 a square foot in retail sales annually, which is blowing it out of the water. Um, and they're packed, and they don't do any advertising. It's all word of mouth, because people love sort of the secret and the experience of going in, stepping on that button, and making it happen. I have a gazillion stories like this of businesses that do you know, weird, kind of unusual things. I told an example today in one of the meetings of um, a Thai restaurant in Des Moines, Iowa, called Taste of Thailand, which has kind of mediocre food. But what they do is uh, capitalizing on Iowa being the first state to do presidential primaries. They got an old voting machine, the kind that has the curtain that opens and closes when you pull a, a lever. And they come up with some nonsense question every week, like, um, should, should Angelina Jolie take back Brad Pitt? And people will go in there and vote on this. And at the end of the week, they call the Des Moines Register and say, uh, here's the vote for the week from Taste of Thailand. And the Des Moines Register runs a box on it, saying, here's the results of the Taste of Thailand poll this week. Simple thing. Cost the guy like 50 bucks at a yard sale to buy this voting machine. And um, it's transformed his business. And you, know, you can also use this kind of enlivening thing to generate ideas in the public. This is a, a artist named Candy Chang in New Orleans who, um, after Katrina, when there were a lot of vacancies that had been boarded up because the windows had blown out, she, put a, she, she printed up these things that look like name tags that say, I wish this was, and a Sharpie, and put a box of these by every storefront. And people would write what they want the business to be um, and, slap it on the, uh, and slap it on the plywood. The most important thing of all is to believe that you'll succeed. Um, communities that do not really believe that will never succeed. I can guarantee it. I have seen hundreds and hundreds of communities fail at revitalization because they think this is beyond our reach, we don't have the resources, whatever it might be. None of those things are true. Any community can make this happen. Um, and Beverly has demonstrated over the past you know, 15 years, and certainly the last eight years, that it can really, really do amazing things. This, this, this downtown is already transformed. There's going to be some heavy lifting ahead, as uh, Jin, Jin, Jin met, uh, uh, mentioned. Um, it's going to be kind of a shift and a major lift to do things like um, thinking about how do we diversify the economy of the district more? How do we begin creating businesses, kind of saying these are the kinds of businesses that we need, and then find the entrepreneur and the capital to make that happen? These are going to be some big, some big changes, um, but I think really, really important for downtown Beverly's future. Um, and there will be plenty of volunteer opportunities, so we hope that everyone is going to be uh, involved in that process. And I'm looking forward to coming back in another eight years for the 2040 plan and seeing how things have changed, uh, have changed again. Um, questions? Things you want to talk about?
has a question or a comment? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you uh, done any study on the Wynwood walls in Miami? I know them well. Okay. Their developer, Tony Goldman, was a friend of mine. Okay. He passed away a few years ago. Can you tell me about how that uh, artist's colony got yeah. developed and if there's anything that we could learn from that sure. piece? Sure. Well, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. She's asking about Wynwood Walls uh, in Miami. Does anybody know Wynwood Walls? Um, it was basically a bunch of one-story concrete block buildings that had been storage units. And this developer named Tony Goldman, who's also responsible for the revival of Soho um, and um, the Deco District in, in Miami, he's an amazing guy, um, bought all these buildings. And he, he's always been sort of an iconoclast, and maybe that's the lesson to take away from it is, you know, color outside the lines um, if you want to. So what he did was he did this, this uh, design competition among uh, graffiti artists in um, Miami, because the city was always like picking on them and making them painting over their work, and he was like, "This stuff is really beautiful." So he did this competition, and he gave sort of each building as a commission to uh, an artist. And so there were like initially, I think about twelve or so buildings, um, and each artist got a building to um, decorate. And it is wildly colorful. He got all these old um, like tractor trailer tires and spray painted those crazy colors, and they're kind of scattered around as seating. Um, and then he tenanted them with um, sort of an eclectic mix of galleries and restaurants and took what was a very marginal neighborhood um, uh, on the edge of the downtown and turned it into this vibrant, cool, alive place. Um, so I think the, the, big, the big takeaway for me is his iconoclasm is saying, why can't we do this? You know, why can't we you know, make this be this incredible thing instead of being an eyesore? So it's a great place. Any correlation to our area of interest? We can do it. Yeah, I mean, I might need to think about, about that a little bit. I mean, you certainly, uh, there, are some, there are some marginal buildings in the downtown that fun things could yeah. be done with. Uh, I go to Wynwood. And I see Beverly when I go. So uh, that's the question, is because it is an artist community yeah. and it, it, it envelops restaurants, it envelops retail, it envelops the artists. And there isn't a sidewalk that you walk on in just this district right. that doesn't have an artist piece on it. Yep. And I just wonder whether yeah. there's something that we can take from that. To, right. To well, I mean, to something this. else to take from it, and I think this is true of Beverly, downtown Beverly in a couple of, of ways, is having the energy and vibrance that I know is inside the buildings spill out more on the streets and be more visible. Um, that's, that's a piece is that you don't, you, I, I, I hear that there's a lot of arts activity in Beverly and I see some pieces of it, but it doesn't match the exuberance I feel when I talk to people. I think the same is true of your history. Um, Beverly has a history that most communities in the US would envy. I mean, it is so rich, it is so storied, so many amazing things have happened here and people have been here and you don't know it. You walk down the street and you don't, you don't know it. So it'd be nice to have that interpreted in some fun, cool way also. Holograms, projections, I don't know, something fun. Before we, the next question comes, I have to share a story with you, though. We had, um, we had a focus group lunch today with Kennedy. With, um, we invited the folks who have contributed money to make this project happen and to enable us to hire Kennedy. And she told the story about the bodega. And one of the people in the room was Jason Sevenor, who you may know as the owner of Designer Bath and Salem Plumbing. And he thought, gee, maybe I could do that at Designer Bath and I'll put a toilet out front. And if you flush the toilet, <laughs> some fun thing happens for you. <laughs> <laughs> so things can happen here in Beverly. Um, like who else that. had a question over, over here? here? Actually, mine is more of a comment. I'm Diane. I've lived here for six months in Beverly. And so I don't know all the stuff 
that had happened beforehand that you're talking about. Um, but if you're thinking of, of still opportunity, I think it's really there. I came, I have a daughter in Middleton I was visiting, wanted to go into Boston. She took me to the train station. And when I got off the train station, I had time to wait. So I walked, started walking, walked down Rantoul, and I saw some of the apartments there. And then I turned around and came back and walked through downtown Beverly. And I had in my mind a thought about maybe moving to this area sometime, but I absolutely fell in love with Beverly. So that's what you've accomplished, and that's what happens, I think, when you get all this started, is that, and since then, my daughter Milton and her couple of her friends at different times have, and some people I know in Boston have come here to just eat, you know, have dinner with me and everything, and it just is, it's a very good, it, it has a vibe to it. So whatever you've done the last 10 years has been really effective, so I can't imagine there's just not new ways to take it. It's these guys directions. that did the work. I just like, well, very good, good going, job. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it definitely has a, has a vibe. There's a great feeling in Beverly that really wasn't here eight years ago. Um, it really was a different, had a different feel. Yeah, it does. Who else? Over here. Can you pass that down, Jen? Thanks. Hello. Have you uh, looked at uh, traffic patterns or at pedestrian zones and how they've been successful in other areas and is it weather dependent or not and is that something that you think might be interesting or of value to Beverly Ave, maybe more pedestrian areas or larger spaces where there aren't cars, things like that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a traffic planner and I, um, you know, I'm sort of a revitalization strategist and so I understand and appreciate what good transit planning does and what bad transit planning can do to hurt, hurt a place. So I don't, I don't really have a lot of significant thoughts about it. I do know I have had trouble crossing the street myself in downtown Beverly from time to time. And I do know that there are some cool um, parks and public spaces that I think could be better animated and more things done with, inc including the common, which, you know, beautiful historic place, but not a lot happens there. So definitely needs some animation. Another question? Anybody? All right, I have some questions for you. So again, if the facilitators can just note the answers that we hear from your few pews there. So one question we were gonna ask you in the small groups was, what is your favorite, well, I'll read it right from the paper. What do you like best about how downtown has changed in the last five years? What do you like best? Or six months. Or six months. You can just shout out answers. Yeah, right there. Mm-hmm. That's a great question and a great yeah. observation. We, and, and let's repeat that back for the... Uh, yeah. For the, uh, so the observation was that there is a variety of, of businesses, but we also do have a couple of businesses like the rent -a center and Family Dollar, which some people really love having those here. The Montserrat students are so excited. They spend a lot of time and money at the Family Dollar because there's no cafeteria at Montserrat. Um, so for some communities in our, for some um, markets in our community, those businesses are actually pretty valuable. Um, Main Streets, though, was actually started in 2002 to keep chain stores from coming downtown. When the Rent-A-Center and Family Dollar opened, a group of um, business owners and community leaders got together and said, we really don't want a lot of chain stores in our downtown. We've got assets here, cultural and historic assets that we really can build upon. So we let's figure out how we do this. Um, we do have, Beverly Main Streets does have a retail incentives program. Um, when we first started it, 
the program was a grant of up to $7,500 to help a business with their first year expenses, but it had to be the kind of business that we really needed downtown. We didn't need another hair salon or another whatever, which are valuable businesses, but we have a lot of those. So we looked at the market analysis that Kennedy did and said, what are the kinds of businesses that we need downtown? A bookstore, check, they got a grant. Um, Bell Market was sat empty for five years. Check, A and B Burger got a grant. Um, now, because we do have a comic book store, um, a regular bookstore, we've got, you know, a wine and beer store, and we've got three home goods stores that we didn't have before. We're going to be much more selective about who we give those grants to. But we have helped um, on Rantoul Street. We helped flourish. We helped. Um, a couple of other businesses down there, Karma Hair Studio, for example, with whether they use the money for signage or whatever, it was a way of saying, these are the businesses that we want downtown and we're willing to help bring them here with a little extra money. So she was actually asking about signs, about so, their signs. So can I say something about it? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Signs, signs that are like the sort of plastiform back, um, 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 backlit signs were designed for, for highway locations. And some, not, like the ones that I showed you where you can't tell where you are because everything looks the same. Um, they were designed to attract attention from a car instead of for a pedestrian who's walking down the street or a car that's moving very slowly um, instead of speeding by at 55 miles an hour. Um, but some national chains just don't, they don't, they are often unwilling to adapt um, and change out the sign. There are plenty of communities that have gotten them to do that, and I'm sure Family Dollar would sell even more if they had a better looking sign, because it's repelling some people while the kids are still going there anyway. Um, and there are communities that have done all kinds of things, with incentive grants for signs, actually providing design assistance. Covington, Kentucky just had this cool program last year where they had, they're kind of trying to like tap into their doo-wop uh, roots, and are, um, they hired this uh, design school, actually, to um, do a studio where they did these cool neon um, overhanging signs for, I think it was 10 businesses in the downtown, so they look kind of retro. They're, it's, they're, they're gorgeous um, signs that look really great. So there are certainly things to do like that. I actually don't mind having some retail chains downtown because they provide a consistent thing that people know that they're going to find. I don't like having them be m much of the downtown, and many of them won't come at all um, because it's not their, not their market. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you, you figure out what's important and you find ways to drive, drive that behavior. Um, I am uh, uh, increasingly fond of what they call form-based codes, which are sort of design. It's like the, the entire community gets together through a series of design workshops and charrettes and kind of figures out what it wants buildings, existing ones and new ones, to look like and function like, um, which is great because then you, then you have a set of guidelines for somebody who wants to rehab a building or build a new one, and if they you know, follow what's in the form-based code, bang, their project's approved and goes sailing through the process. If they don't want to do that, they can do it the old-fashioned way. But what it does, what it has the ability to do, is not just penalize the downtown by making it have the most stringent requirements, like design requirements, but extends those, those design standards to the entire community so that the new businesses... Like, I always think it's kind of weird that we are so concerned with the design of the downtown, which already, downtowns already look great. They've got great bones, they've got great stuff. And we let this awful stuff happen out on the, out on the highway. You know, That's what really needs the design regulation, is that stuff out there. So I'd like, I like the idea of having sort of a, um, a system of design guidelines that applies to everyone and helps ensure that the design heritage of the, of the historic parts of the community get carried forth into the new parts too. So we also do work with the city on a facade and sign improvement program, which is another grant program that the city funds and that we help administer. And what we've helped do is get signs like La Victoria or the 
the f multicolored metal fish that hangs in front of Bonefish Harry's, um, the new Mingo sign that used to be this big old thing that had like a canvas nothing. It, it literally was wrapped in a piece of canvas and now it's this really cool sign. So we totally agree with you. We're also looking at, we're trying to spend that money in a way that brings a color and dimensionality to the downtown and use signage as a way to say, this is kind of an artsy community. So great question. Who else? What else do you love about downtown? Yes. That's a great observation. Um, so the veteran, the new um, veterans, Vietnam Veterans Memorial at Ellis Square, if you haven't seen that, I strongly encourage you to go look at it. It's a brand new piece of public art. There's a couple of people in this room like Kevin Haratunian who really spearheaded making that happen. Um, Main Streets had the idea to redo the park, but the veterans under, with Kevin's facilitation and some help from Montserrat College of Art, did a national call for public art, and we were so blessed to get that, that artist from Colorado who really listened to the story about what happened in that space back in the late 50, 60s, 60s and 70s, I guess. And um, it's just, it's such a poignant memorial. Um, it's, it's you, you really need to go check it out at Ellis Square. It's really something. So thank you for that. What else do you like about downtown? That's great. Energy, vitality, the Cabot, Montserrat. Let me ask you this. What don't you like about downtown that's happened in the last five years? Yeah, John. That's great. That's a really great way to look at that. Thank you. What don't you like downtown? Yes, Joan. You repeat Thank that you back? for that observation. Can you repeat that back for the video? So the, the question was, um, or the comment was about the status and condition of the GAR hall, which needs a little TLC. There are some people in the room sitting way back there in the back row, and the Ward 2 Civic Association that have kind of adopted that piece of property and are working really hard to change what it looks like today. So thank you for that observation. What else don't you like? Yes. Can I take the mic? Sure. I want to get out and walk around and, and talk to people. It just this is a very friendly city, and it just makes you feel like you go home again every time you go through downtown Beverly. 
you'll always see someone smiling or talking or chatting or they'll say good morning to you from some areas where we lived in Connecticut for 30 years. You never had that. So this is like a gift when you go through Beverly. And it's fun to go through the shops and see what people are making and buying and it's just a great place to be. I'll tell you something that, that strikes me, it, it hit me today. Three times today I was trying to um, turn from a side street onto Cabot and like traffic was just coming and coming and coming. Three times somebody stopped and flashed his lights to say go. It's like, you guys are like close to Boston, right? Like what, <laughs> you know, what, there's, something, there's something different here. Something happens when you cross that water. It was, uh, it was stunning. That would never happen in DC, I, I guarantee it. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep walking the mic around. Yeah, we have a, I don't like over here. Over here? The thing that's been distressing me are all these apartment buildings that are going up. Um, they're overpriced. There are too many of them. And the whole feeling, for me anyway, of Beverly, when you walk down Rantoul now, it's not, it's not there. What a that might be helpful just in planning going forward. Well, it's it feels it feels temporary. Those those apartments. Have you been in them? They're very temporary. Tell us a little bit more about that. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, the one near the um, post office. Mm -hmm. I went in there and a gentleman showed me a one bedroom and there was one bedroom and a bathroom and a kitchen and living room that are all one room and I asked him if he would show me a two bedroom. The two bedroom was this exactly same size exactly the same size as the one bedroom except they cut two bed two bedrooms in that place it felt like a hotel and out in the in the um, hall and there were like nine or ten apartments on each floor I, they think it's very cute but they have a big thing a big sink. And I said, what is this for? And the gentleman said, for washing your dogs. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. When we moved to Beverly the first time, a long time ago, um, and my kids grew up in Beverly. And uh, the things I do like are, I have one son who's gay, and they pretty much were killing him in the high school. I had to send him out to, um, what was the name of it? Simon's Rock. And he went out there for three years on a, on a scholarship. I adopted a transracial child she went through hell. That's changed now, and that's lovely. I love, you know, when, when Jamie, who's an actor in New York, when he comes up and he sees the flags on all the churches, you know, he goes, he just loves that. Um, I don't know, it just feels so ordinary, all of these apartments. It's a, you know, um, a, um, um, nationally, this, ki this kind of apartment, sort of smaller units with shared spaces that people do things in together, is what the market wants now. It is what younger people are gravitating towards. 
um, smaller, smaller living units with larger communal spaces. Um, and I think the fact that these have rented up so quickly here says that there really is a market for it. And my sense is that the people who are coming to Beverly are bringing some of that good vibe, some of that tolerance and diversity with them. So I think it's, it's been a lot of change in a short period of time, and I think that's a little bit, I can hear that's a little bit um, 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 I'm jarring to people, but I think it's going to be a good thing. It's, 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 it's putting more residents downtown who are going to be customers of the downtown businesses and not need a car to get there to do it. So I think it's, I think it's worth giving it some time to see how it settles in, but um, it is what young people are looking for now, and it's, it's uh, certainly been a success here. Do they tend to be commuters into the city of Boston, or are they hanging out in in Beverly? I, just... I, I don't. I can't. I can't answer that definitively because I don't know the answer. But my sense is, from speaking to a bunch of people, some who live there and others who live here, is that many of them do commute in, but they come back here and hang out. And some of them are have friends who are moving here too because Beverly is becoming a fun place. No, I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking that would. And you love Beverly. That's why you moved here. Um, the new apartments, you know. Right. Right. She says she's in, she's, in an, she's in one of those apartments and, and likes it. Um, we need the mic, so Wait, let's... Um, this woman's been waiting. Okay. Sorry. Hey, um, my name is Patty. I moved here two years ago, and I wanted to... I don't know what it was like 10 years ago, <clears throat> but we came here kind of almost on a fluke. Uh, my daughter lives in Somerville, and of course, everybody knows you can't buy houses in Somerville. So we bought a house in Beverly. We're right near the water. We can walk to the train and take the train to Boston. We can walk to the library. We can walk to church. We can walk to some great restaurants. And it's just a wonderful place. I love it. And I think it's lucky that we ended up here because it feels like a small town, and yet it has a lot of the advantages of the big city. That's some of the things I don't like are the things that are moving out of downtown, which is what's happening all over. But for instance, I love being able to walk to the Y, but the Y is not there anymore. If you want to go to the Y, you have to get in your car and drive. So things like that are the things that I don't like. and hold the bottom button. Thank you. Thank you. Here we have, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. That was amazing. And I love how you boil down um, seven things that we need to do. That's fascinating to me. Um, one of the things that, I'm the city councilor for downtown, Estelle Rand. And uh, one of the things that I don't like about downtown right now is just the, the pedestrian safety. Actually, I think, and I know that's something that the administration is working on and that I've heard a lot about, but I'd love to see us actually just go really gung-ho into making it a super safe place for, for walking between restaurants and the theater and things like that. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there, there's plenty of low-touch solutions, too. I mean, I'm sure the city is working on a I bunch agree. of things. But <laughs> there, I mean, in, in the neighborhood, so I, I, live in, I live in Arlington, Virginia. Um, horrifyingly somewhat. I live in Crystal City, which is where Amazon just announced it's coming. Um, but they, uh, so we have some changes ahead there. But one of the things that they did last month was they painted the crosswalks with these like flowers. And all of a sudden, ev every car slows down. I think they feel like they're gonna run over fresh flowers or something. I don't know what they're doing, but they kind of like stop. And just that one thing has slowed traffic down by like five miles an hour. So paint, just paint. Aaron, can, oh. Was there a question over here? Or a comment? Thank you. Um, we own property on two of the main streets, Cabot Street and Rantoul. 
so we get to see a lot of RAND tools, especially. And you opened your presentation talking about um, shopping carts and those kind of drawbacks and dirty. RAND Tool Street is still very much so. And is there any sort of campaign uh, through Beverly Main Streets as far as the commercial spaces and property owners to be a good neighbor, which means clean up in front of your building for commercial spaces, especially the restaurants, to not let your dumpsters overflow. There is a rat problem, especially on Rantoul Street, and I see the trash there constantly. Not only the cigarette butts, cans, bottles in the gutter. It is really terrible. Recently, I brought to the attention of Walgreens the fact that they had not weeded, cleaned up their property, which is a whole big block that they cover, four sides. They have uh, residential on some sides facing them. And the manager said he's been trying for months and months to get Walgreens, the order to go through for them to do some, a little bit of landscaping. It finally happened, but it took a complaint from someone who walks by there a lot and sees it. Mm. And how do you encourage uh, residents right. and commercial spaces? We have nice new sidewalks, we have new streets, we have bike lanes, we have new trees. That's all wonderful. But when the climate does not change for the residents or the commercial spaces and they just let things you know, go to pieces, it detracts tremendously. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, you know, that's, that's a very fixable thing, and I mm -hmm. think we could talk about ways to do that. Some things I've seen, I, I have found that one of the things that gets people moving more than anything else is just setting a good example and doing it. Mm -hmm. There was a guy that I, I worked with for years named Chuck Russell in Oskaloosa, Iowa, who is this kind of like Midwestern philosopher who also had, um, 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 owned this title abstract company. Mm -hmm. um, he once told me that a, a business open from nine to five is catering to the unemployed which I thought was just brilliant. But he, um, he, would, he would go up and down the street every morning going to work and, and pull weeds up out of the mm -hmm. sidewalks. And people, it was like everybody was embarrassed that he was doing this, mm -hmm. and they weren't. Everybody started doing it. He mm -hmm. just kind of started a trend. So I think there's, um, there, there's a woman that I met once in a State College, Pennsylvania, named Lorraine Franz, who organized this big art festival. And the biggest problem that the festival had was trash mm -hmm. because the, tra the trash cans would overflow. She turned this into a fundraising event for the community and basically auctioned off at this big, this big deal event, auctioned off the privilege of serving on the trash crew um, for the art <laughs> festival. And so she had all the, all the captains of industry out there, all the bank presidents were you know, bidding 1,000, 1,500 bucks. And all they got for it was a baseball hat that said the proud, the few, the trash crew, and two <laughs> days of hard work. And they were out there picking up the trash. And believe me, their banks and their industries were a lot cleaner after that because they were not gonna tolerate people being sloppy. Right. So I think there's, there's there's fun, if you can make it be kind of a fun thing or an embarrassing thing, mm -hmm. um, you, can, uh, you can get some mileage. Right, I think that's important. Yep. City leaders and main streets have done a tremendous job of what has happened on Rantoul Street. I own property on Rantoul, I've been there for 30 years, and it was a place you did not want to be after sun, after, after the sun went down, you did not want to be on Rantoul Street. Whole different scene now. And for better or worse, whether you are, are for the high rises or not, it's done a tremendous job of revitalizing Rantoul Street and the restaurants and the young people that are around. Um, it's been a really positive change, in my opinion. Well, yeah, and as I said, I really think that a lot has been done and a lot of folks have put their time in including Jen to, to ha so you're right, it does need to keep moving and maybe it will continue down Rantoul Street. So. The streetscape improvements look fabulous. I was almost disoriented when I saw it after having seen it eight years ago. It was like, whoa, this is huge. Thank you for, uh, for doing this, Beverly Main Streets. Um, one thing I miss in the downtown is a grocery store. Uh, I, I miss Bell Market. I miss being able to walk down, yep. not, not a convenience store, but a, a small grocery store, mm -hmm. buy a carton of milk, nice loaf of bread. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, you know, if I, if I lived here, I would miss that too. It's kind of funny that Bell Market closed just before people started living downtown again, because um, the market might have come back for them. And there, there are lots of communities that are uh, having great success in creating their own locally owned, like community owned um, grocery stores. My, my partner, 
Josh Bloom, who lives in Philadelphia, um, is the president of a co-op grocery store in his neighborhood that now has two other branches in other neighborhoods in Philly. Um, and it's, you know, it's small, but it provides everything people need. And because it's a co-op, it doesn't have quite the profit motiva um, um, a motivation that a chain would. And it's, it, they're doing really, really well. And there's, I can probably think of 50 examples that have opened in the past year in downtowns. So it's definitely, as you get more residents here, there's going to be a bigger and bigger market for it. And I think that, I think that can probably happen. Any other uh, one area that I feel like could really use uh, some attention is uh, right in front of the uh, Beverly Depot, where Casa de Luca used to be, where the press box used to be. Um, people who are coming through our town on the train, they look out there. You wouldn't want to necessarily get off and walk around town looking at what's right there, not knowing that Cabot Street's only a block away and it's a beautiful place. Uh, that whole block, that whole radius right there, I feel like could use some attention. And I know it's not a novel idea, it's been talked about, but uh, not a lot of change has happened in a while. So I think that's a huge area of opportunity. She's asking if there, if there a reason why, it ha there you go. No, I was just, well, just to state, I moved to Beverly in 1980. And the one thing I said when I moved here is this town has so much potential. Like I could just see the potential and how much it's been realized over the past 10 and 15 years is just Phenomenal. I would not want to live anywhere else. Um, my question was just a follow-up to, I always wondered why that hasn't had any improvement. And I had heard rumors that it's historical relevance, you couldn't touch the building. And I just want to know, is it urban legend? What's, what's, what is with that corner? Yeah. Do you want to address that? She's asking um, why that hasn't, why it hasn't moved yet. I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you ask again with the mic like really close to your mouth? I know you don't want to do that, Dan. Oh, that's but. okay. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering where he brought up, you know, where the, um, when you come into the train station, where the restaurant used to be and the pool hall used to be, why is that still an ISO? Why is not, that have not been developed? Is there some zoning or some, reg what, I'm just wondering. So, um, uh, several years ago, the, Massachusetts State Historic Commission, and maybe Matt, you can help me out with this because you know it, the story better, but they, um, they put a five-year demolition delay on those buildings, which I understand is up in the next year or two, Aaron. I don't know if you can help me out with that. Yeah, I, um, and maybe mention let me try the to city, give a little, a little the city work. There. Yeah, so uh, the, there's a, a veterans housing, uh, that's the old box building, it's the brick five-story building right next to the train station was redeveloped um, using historic tax credits. Um, and first what had to happen was a historic district had to be created for that area. And to create a, a, a historic district, it's a state or federal historic, historic district, um, there needs to be a number of contributing buildings to create a, an actual district. There needs to be enough historic infrastructure there to, to establish that. Um, so the box building was clearly one of those. It received tax credits for redevelopment. It's, it's an equity, a piece of equity to help um, take and, and uh, repurpose historic buildings. Um, the press box, uh, or the building known as the press box, it's uh, the Hotel T Tafton, or Trafton, I believe, Tafton. Um, it was originally a, a railroad hotel. Um, that was a contributing building, and so, um, when the uh, property went to uh, uh, demolish that building for redevelopment, um, the Mass Historic uh, had basically denied that and said that their tax credits were in jeopardy, um, um, that were attached to the other building. And tax credits vest over a period of time, five years typically, and so, um, you know, that, that left the developer with a, a, a challenging decision to make. And so, um, it's not a forever, um, barrier, but it's certainly a barrier. Um, there's nothing relative to zoning or, you know, a local historic district there that would prevent its, its redevelopment, whether it's to preserve the building or, or raise it and build something new. There's, there's multiple options there. In the meantime, when I see a vacant building, to me it is a blank projection screen waiting for a video project. So mm -hmm. I think there are still ways to enliven the site without um, touching the building. So Matt might want to add to that. This is our last comment on this question, and then we have another question for you. Okay, I just want to add to this. This is a very abnormal situation. 
When a national register district is created, it's to encourage preservation. And the reason why these tax credits were challenged is the Mass Historic Commission said to Windover, you cannot manipulate the national register like this. It's an economic development program to fix old buildings up. And you can't fix one building up and destroy another building. That would destroy an entire historic district. A historic district in Beverly centered on transportation and industrial history that's very rich. So they said, you're not getting your tax credits. So Windover said, we changed our mind. We've seen the light. And we realize these buildings must remain. Now they said it in a vague way, not knowing what will happen to the building. So the Mass Historic said, all right, your tax credits are approved. All they have to do is wait five years to get their money back. And then they can do whatever they want with those buildings and not lose any tax credit money. So this is a very abnormal situation. It shouldn't be like this. One of the things that I have to say, what I don't like about Beverly is the fact that there are only a few people here that get to decide for everyone else. I look at communities like Newburyport, how beautiful it is. They don't tear down historic buildings left and right, but this seems to be the mindset here. This is the urban renewal of the 50s in Beverly. And one of the things, I respect you as a preservationist, Kennedy Smith. One of the presentations you gave, you said, historic preservation is very important to revitalizing downtown. We've forgotten that. And this is urban renewal from the 1950s. We have buildings like Boston City Hall going up at the Friendly site that totally do not belong in this community because they just look so odd. They don't fit in. So I want to know how you feel as a preservationist there are all these great reasons why you save old buildings, the connections to history, the architecture. We have a national register district that's gonna be thrown away. And I would challenge anyone, I'll give you a hundred bucks, if you can find a national register district with the history that we have in Beverly. Railroad hotels, a carriage company, a train station, a post office, all this industrial history. There's no other place like it in this region. We have it in Beverly and we're gonna throw it away so we can get more apartment buildings. So I wanna know how you feel as a preservationist, because I've been fighting for preservation in Beverly and getting nowhere, but people like John Cuff and John Hall, Susie Lamont, there are a lot of good people who say, you know, he makes sense with his arguments, but we get drowned out. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I feel your pain and I hear you, and I have um, I've asked over eight years why there isn't more of a preservation ethic in, in Beverly. I wonder it too. It has great buildings, it has a great history, it has an amazing history. There are communities that would die for this history, you know, to have it, um, who don't. I wish there were more, I wish there were more historic buildings being, being preserved here. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you ever heard uh, Mayor, former Mayor Riley of, South, of Charleston, South Carolina speak? He, he's done a, it'd be worth having him come here sometime to do a presentation. He was the longest serving mayor in Charleston's history, 34 years. And he has a passion about saving every historic building there is. There was one building that the, um, uh, when he was uh, sort of um, 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 early in his career, and a hurricane had blown through Charleston as it always does, and the building was literally leaning, it was a wood frame building, leaning against the next one, and the mayor wanted to go in and take a look, and the city crew was like pulling him back, mayor, you can't go in there, you'll be flattened. And uh, this building has to come down next week. And he said, no, it's not. No, it's not. We're preserving it. It's going to be affordable housing. And um, he made it happen. He used low-income housing tax credits and the historic rehab credits and got 80% of the equity that he needed for the building to be rehabbed. So it's, it's certainly doable. It is, every community has its own personality. This is one thing I don't quite get about Beverly, but I would love for there to be a stronger preservation ethic here. One more, one more, and then we oh, have sorry. one more question. I'll be a quick, quick. You said um, that was the last one. I was making a couple notes on what you said about millennials and how they like to fix and repurpose and share and locally yep. grown, and it seems like uh, the historic buildings and the cultural assets that we have here would fit hand in glove with uh, that as an economic uh, development driver. I totally agree with you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lydia. I guess I'm a self-identified elder millennial. Um, <laughs> I, um, this is my the second elders. stint in Beverly. Um, I've lived here for a year, and I live and work in downtown Beverly, and I also work in Salem. 
and I love Beverly, and um, I'm coming from Chicago where I could walk everywhere, and I feel like I can very much do the same thing here, and it's quite wonderful to be able to do that in a New England seaside town. Um, but one of the things that I really struggled when I moved here as a creative individual was finding affordable housing. And uh, the new apartment buildings, while they're glossy and sort of offer a all-encompassing experience in its very structure, lack character and history. Um, and I was completely deterred from that. And so my you know, house hunting um, took a lot longer and I finally found something and I absolutely love it. But I just wonder if we are interested and we need this sort of creative economies here how can we expect artists to stay here? We have an incredible art college in downtown Beverly and the students can't afford to stay here. Um, so I think historic preservation is incredibly important and it's also incredibly important to think about the types of economies we want here and how we can keep those people here. So thanks. Yeah, you know, my, my, as I, I've been you know, talking to people here for a month now and I've absorbed lots of different messages and I've heard some threads that are running through conversations and my sense is that the um, the new apartments are you know they're serving a need here that you know is big and could transform Beverly in a good way by making it a more walkable community I think people are reacting to the design of the buildings and saying uh, I'm not sure if we had this to do again I would exactly do it like this and so I think um, people didn't have anything to react to until they were here and so I think this is um, a moment when it's important for everyone to not beat each other up about this, but to think, to take some time and think, what can we learn from this going forward? What does it mean in terms of what Beverly's architectural heritage is? What does it mean in terms of affordable housing? What does it mean in terms of what we need in the future for everybody to, to thrive here? So I think it's, it's a good, it's given us a good opportunity to pause and take a look and think about what's good and what hasn't worked as well as we'd hoped and make that part of the mix for 2030. Okay, we have one more question for you that we really appreciate that you're sticking around for. And that is, we've talked about what we like, we've talked about what we don't like. What are we missing? A grocery store. A grocery store. Just shout out your answers. Hotel. Hotel. I'm staying in Salem. <laughs> Hotel where I could walk to a restaurant. What else do we need? Waterfront. Well, we have the waterfront, we just don't have it developed. <laughs> what, John, what did you say? Waterfront restaurant. I heard bus transportation here. Better transportation, sorry. Professional offices downtown. What else? Bike shares. More public art. More public art. Performance space, yeah. Refillable water stations. Family-friendly stuff? We've heard that from a lot of people that we've asked, that we've met in our different listening tour things. What else? Yeah. Uh, maybe a winter carnival, something to do in the winter. Something to do in the winter. Winter, winter carnival kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Co-working spaces. That's great, the farmer's market, big asset. Brian. Outdoor skating rink. Outdoor skating rink. Anything else? Okay. What was that? Bowling alley. Oh, a bowling, oh. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's. That's a tricky one to end on. Um, 
Well, thank you all for sticking with us tonight, all of your input, and we hope you also fill out the comment card so we can use that input. Um, all of this is being documented and channeled to Kennedy for use in her report, um, and so also for, for our board and our committees to consider again what we think we might be capable of doing. So we've got some people in the room that are on our board, we've got some people in the room that are on our committees. Everybody who's a volunteer for Main Streets, would you raise your hand? That's a, that's a good group of, of <laughs> folks. Um, I didn't see you two volunteer, raise your hands, but. So if anybody does wanna work with us on 2030, we welcome your participation on the committee. Um, we've also got event committees. Our next big event is Beverly's New Year, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. So we're really excited about that. Um, but if you wanna help, we'd be happy to have you. So. There's a sign-up sheet in the back for the newsletter. You can just put a star next to your name and that'll tell us that you're willing to volunteer and we'll get in touch with you. So thanks again. Oh, Aaron. Can I just make a real quick plug since yeah. I heard a, a couple comments about the waterfront. Tomorrow night, um, there's an open house to look at uh, the waterfront plan that is being drafted um, in, in partnership with the city and Harriman, which is the consultant. It's gonna be at the library at 6.30. It's going to start um, and go for several hours. It's an open house, so you can pop in and leave as you please. So if you're interested in that sort of topic, we can dive into that. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So thanks, everybody. Stay warm out there. Good night. <laughs>